God, thank you uh, for another evening together with my brothers and sisters. Thank you for another evening where your extended family, which becomes my extended family, gets to rally together for, for some time. Rally together for some time in, in community, some time in prayer, some time in, in song and celebration, and some time in your word that we might be encouraged once again by who you are and all that you do in our life. So, Spirit of God, uh, if there are areas in our lives um, that uh, correction is needed, through your word, w- would you bring that out? Would you show us? Maybe, maybe it's not so much action, but maybe a, a heart shift that needs to take place. Spirit, tell us. Show us. Convict us that, that we would repent and walk in freedom and restoration. And in areas of our lives, uh, as we look at these, these passages tonight where comfort is needed, Spirit of God, comfort us. Put wind in our sails, Jesus. We love you. We trust you. In your holy name, amen. Amen. It was my, my first day of college, and um, I had just uh, jumped into my first college class, uh, or I'd rather, I had just left my first college class, um, and uh, I was in that class for all but five minutes, and I just knew right away, thank you, in the front, thank you, fellas, for, for moving forward. I took a shower today, too. That's good. I'm glad I did that. Uh, uh, first day of college, first college class. Man, I'm five minutes into this class, and I know I'm dropping it. Any of you guys ever been there? You're, like, you're in there, you're like, nah, that's too much work. I'm, I'm bouncing. I'm going to go straight to the registrar's office after this. I'm dropping it. We'll, we'll trade it out with golf or tennis or something else, right? Uh, so I, I finished my first class, and I, I attended a uh, private liberal arts school, and so at our school, we had chapel. Um, every so often. So after my first class, it was, it was time for chapel, the first chapel of the year. And uh, they decided, uh, the, the university I was at was a few thousand students, and so they decided for this first chapel, we want to all come together. We had two chapel locations traditionally, but for the first chapel of the year, we're going to try and cram everyone into our event center. And so there I went, college freshman, knowing no one, like kind of, not scared to death, but I'm not the most outgoing, extroverted person you'll meet. And uh, so I'm already overwhelmed because I got to drop this class and I don't know how, even how to do that, right? But I, I, I make my way into our uh, university's event center and I find a, a seat kind of up in kind of the, the upper echelon of seats, the not great seats, but kind of bleacher section. And I know no one, I sit by myself and I'm wondering, what is this chapel thing that, that's going to happen? And it kicks off with like a a small introduction and then a a full team, a full band leading us in song, leading us in worship. So there I was, knowing no one, and yet everyone's standing to sing, a few thousand of us standing to sing. And and, uh, I think I, I can't recall if I knew the song or not, but I know that this happened as I stood to sing and I was quiet for but a moment, I heard several thousand young adult voices singing in unison, at least in heart. Maybe their tempo and their beats were off a little bit, uh, but in unison to my God, to our God. And I was moved. I mean, I remember it so clearly. I remember the hair sticking up on my arms, the chills coming about, and me trying to fight tears back. Like, I know no one, and everyone's going to just see me weeping and snotty and crying. Like, I can't do this. What are you doing, God? But I just remember becoming so, so undone, so overwhelmed at what a blessing it was, if you will, if I could use that term, that language, what a blessing it was to be with perfect strangers but yet family. To be with men and women I've never met, and some of them I would never see again except for that one moment, but yet to feel so at home, to feel so unified. There's something special about so many of us coming from so many different walks of life, so different than my own, with crazy stories and circumstances, either in the past circumstances or current circumstances, and yet together we can come and we can be unified in praising God. It moved me. It struck me. Have you guys ever been in a situation like that, similar? Maybe it was a chapel at at the university you go to or or went to. Maybe it's it's Sunday nights. Maybe it's this. Maybe it's a, a Sunday morning. Maybe it was a retreat you went to, a conference you went to, something where where you maybe it's next weekend. Maybe it's every Easter. When the body of Christ comes together, 
to focus on the resurrected life of Jesus in our own. Something special, a blessing, if you will, I'm going to use that language for the psalm that we're going to look at. There's something special, a blessing, if you will, about the extended family of God coming together. It's powerful. It's powerful. And I don't know about you, but for me, it's not so much um, a numbers thing. It's not so much the number of people coming. And I know some of us, maybe not some of us here, but some of us are like, yeah, I I hate big churches. Yeah, smaller. Yeah. Okay, cool. Whatever. You might have trouble with heaven, but that's okay. Uh, or hell. I don't know where your heart's at. You might have trouble with that too. But, but what I'm saying, it's not so much the numbers, but the spirit of unity. I've been in a setting where thousands, tens of thousands rally together to worship God, and I get chills. I've been in little classrooms with, with six to ten people maybe, and I get the same chills. It has nothing, very little for me to do with the numbers, but more about the spirit of the heart in the space, the spirit of the heart in the men and women around me. Haven, I pray, may we never lose sight of the blessing it is to come together with brothers and sisters. Whether it's in a small group setting inside a living room or at a in and out or in a setting like this or larger than this, it is such a blessing and we cannot forsake it. See, tonight we close, uh, close out our time in what we've titled the Song of Ascents. It's titled that in your Bible, uh, maybe a subtext, but there are 14 psalms, sorry, 15 psalms uh, in your Bibles from Psalms 120 to Psalms 134. And these are all uh, titled Song of Ascents. If you would look at the, the whatever your heading is, uh, the subtitle would say, A Song of Ascents, maybe of David or of Solomon or of Asaph or of no one, just a song of ascents. And these were songs that we believe, there's a few traditions, one of the, the more, um, uh, maybe you could use the word popular, I don't know if that's the best term, but, but one tradition that many assume these songs were for was for this reason and purpose. Three times a year, Back in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy, God instructs the people of God. He says, hey, listen, three times a year, I want you guys to make your way to Jerusalem. I want you to go on a road trip of sorts. I want you to, to journey, make a pilgrimage journey back to Jerusalem for different, three different feasts. And most of these feasts were centered around uh, remembering God for what he's done in the past, celebrating what he's done throughout their ancestral history. And some of these feasts, too, were, were not only about the past, praising him for the past, but praising him for the present because of the harvest that maybe they had. Praise God for the harvest that you gave us. So three times a year, all of the men were required to show up to the temple, but the whole family would journey back to Jerusalem. And they would consider these psalms. They would pray or recite these psalms out loud as they journeyed. In, in Haven, we talk about this every week. These were more than road trip songs to pass the time, okay? These were worship songs to prepare the heart, to prepare the mind as they enter into the holy city, as they enter into the temple to worship not only their creator, but, but our creator. And I think it's so, so special um, especially considering today. Today, as far as church calendar is concerned, to, today is considered Palm Sunday. Some of you guys are familiar with the story of Jesus as he entered into the city on a donkey and many waving these palm branches, crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, right? That, that was a call. Hosanna wasn't another name for Jesus. That was a call to like, save us, save us now, save now would be how you define Hosanna. Man, our Messiah is here. Come on, help us out. Save now, they're crying out. And so I wonder, man, like myself, that, that freshman first day of college in chapel, or maybe some of you in settings, uh, it was so moving. I wonder what it was like to be in the city on this day so many years ago, where the family of God is reunited. The family of God comes to, to center around Jesus. Many of people were there crying out to Jesus or maybe weren't on that side of the city, but, but little did they know they had shown up to celebrate Passover. That's why Jesus was there. He was journeying back too. They had shown up to celebrate Passover, but little did they know that they would be a part of a Passover that the world would never forget. So what I want to do is I just want to look at these final two psalms to complete our journey 
and to consider as we enter into Easter this next week. And, and it might even be something to consider um, just for yourself that um, this Sunday being Palm Sunday, at some point, maybe even before this particular Sunday, Jesus would have worked through these psalms as well. I really believe that as Jesus journeyed back to Jerusalem, as he would as, as a proper Jewish adult, male, and in submission to God, that he too, maybe even with his disciples, would have worked through these psalms. So let's look at arguably what was possibly the last psalm that Jesus would have considered before entering into the city on the back of a donkey. We're going to look at Psalms 133, 134. They're very brief. I think it'll be a brief evening of teaching in, in the Word. There's only six verses, but they're powerful. Look at this. Psalm 133. Blessed unity of the people of God, a song of ascents of David. This is, this is one of four song of ascents that's attributed to David, okay? Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron running down on the edge of his garments. It's like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing life forevermore. Contextually, if this is a psalm of David being one that maybe David penned, some would believe that, that this is a song that David penned and wrote uh, after he became king and uh, became king of every tribe. Because initially he was only king of his own tribe, two tribes to the south, and then eventually became king of all 12 of the tribes. So maybe this was, was birthed out of his heart of recognizing finally the whole families together. But, but look at this, good and pleasant, how good and pleasant it is to dwell together in unity. When the extended family of God comes together in settings like this or, or others that we've already discussed, I believe it to be both good and pleasant. Good and pleasant. You and I have many encounters throughout our week, right? Even this past week, we could list through the different people we've run into, groups we've found ourselves in. And I think very rarely, and, and maybe even hard-pressed would we, would we be to, to share that my encounter with X or this group or that group or these workers were both good and pleasant. <laughs> Sometimes the, the exchange with people are, oh, it was good, well, not so pleasant. Right? Sometimes, oh, it was, it was pleasant, but it just wasn't a good conversation. When the family of God comes together, it is both good and pleasant. I listened to one pastor describe it, it this way. Um, we got any people that like to eat? Anyone? A few? Okay. Some of you guys I'm a little concerned about, but okay. Uh, I, I was just texting with someone uh, before this evening confirming a, a lunch meeting, and uh, I said there's two types of people in the world, right? You guys know this, right? There's only two types, right? The people that live to eat and the people that eat to live. I'm, I'm more like, I live to eat. I'm not just trying to eat to stay. No, I just love eating, right? We love food. And, and hopefully some of us have a slightly different diet today than you did when you were in high school. Maybe a little bit. Maybe at least you're a little more conscious. Some of us, maybe? No? We're still living on Mountain Dew and Taco Bell? Is that what it is? Okay, okay. Well, here, here's the idea. There are things that uh, might be good for our bodies. Food that we would eat that would be good, but not too pleasant tasting, right? Like, chill off the, the Brussels sprouts, you know what I mean? Like, okay, that's, that's great, but I don't think so. And yet, on the other hand, there are things that are pleasant to consume, but may not be so good for the body. Talk about Mountain Dew, right? Right? You know what I'm talking about? And yet... I, man, you, you get older and your body just changes, y'all. I'm just telling you, you know. This week I had my, me and our, our middle school pastor, Pastor Cody, we went and got lunch. I took him to Chicken Shack, just want to catch up. And he's like, oh, look at that. It's this thing, like fried chicken, cheese, fried egg, gravy, wrapped in a waffle. And I'm like, dude, 
what are you, like, my high school self is like, let's try that. But, but myself now is like, bad news, bro. That, that's like, that's pleasant, but it ain't so good to your body, you know? And I watched him, like, get really excited. He got halfway through it, and the guy threw him the towel. I don't even th- think he was present the rest of our conversation. He was hurting so bad. So, so, so there are things that are good, but not pleasant. There are things that are pleasant, but not good. However, the psalmist says, and I think some of us can testify, when the family of God comes together, it is both good and pleasant. When you dwell amongst one another, and this word dwell, we can we could define several different ways. When we dwell, when we live amongst each other, could be uh, permanently, really close. Uh, we have some, some friends that are just a neighborhood over that we started to become friends with. Our kids are the same ages, and I'm just so excited that we have someone so close, kind of same slice of life, that's like, man, it was good and pleasant to have dinner at their house this evening. We, we have, it could be you dwell in close proximity for longer stretches of time. It could be uh, shorter spurts of time, once every three, three times a year, maybe, for the Jewish people. It could be just, just once a week. We're coming together on Sunday nights. However, the duration, when we dwell, when we root with one another, when we live amongst one another, it is good and pleasant. It's an enjoyable experience and it's good for my spirit. It's pleasant. And man, it's good for me. Good and pleasant. We dwell together in unity. That word unity, that's, that's something that Jesus prayed for. You guys remember this? I'm going to read it. You guys can flip or click if you want. I didn't make a slide. Sorry about that. John 17. It's really the Lord's Prayer. Some of us grew up learning that the Lord's Prayer is our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You know, we like say that in the huddle before the football game or something, like we're really spiritual at that moment. Come on. Like, but that's not the Lord. John 17 is truly, it's Jesus pouring out his heart. And this is what Jesus prays for, for you and I. He prays for you and I. John 17, 20. I do not pray for these alone, talking about his current disciples, but also though for those who will believe in me through their word. Those in the future that would come to faith, right? 21, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you. That they also may be one in us. That the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them, and you in me that they may be, perfect, be, may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. We can get in a slight theological debate about, is Jesus talking for the body of Christ to be one together? Is he talking for the individuals to be one with the Father? Is he, yes, yes, I'm not here to... to, to fight over over that. What I'm saying is God's heart is for unity. The desire of people coming together, the desire of, of his family experiencing something that is good and pleasant was on the heart of God. And unity, truly, truly, unity is a, is a blessing. It's a gift from God, guys. I, I hope we recognize this a, a little bit. You see, I don't think unity is something that we fight to create. Unity in the body of Christ is not something we fight to create, but it's something that we fight to protect. The unity is God-given. We just fight to protect what we have through Christ and because of Christ. It's Ephesians 4. I'll read it to you. Ephesians 4, 1 through 3, Paul writes this. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you are called, with all lowliness and gentleness with long suffering, bearing with one another in love. Verse 3, this is it. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Not to create, not to, but to keep what we already have together because of Jesus. The unity that believers and followers of Jesus share is because of Christ. It's because of Christ. 
It's not because of anything we do because we sing the same song that you sang or, or we're even under the same roof all the time. No, no, no. What we have is because of Jesus. So look how the author describes it, this, this unity that we experience when we dwell together. Look at verse 2. It is like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. This unity, this, this coming together, it's good and pleasant, right? In this day, culturally, um, uh, believe it or not, uh, they didn't have deodorant. They didn't have uh, anti-perspirant uh, 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 self-care products, right? So as they would journey for great distances, great lengths, for whatever reason, maybe for the feast or the festivals in the city, or, hey, we got a dinner date with so-and-so, okay, we're going to go over to their house. You know what sometimes they'd do? They, they'd have a, a bottle or a vial of, of some sort of good and pleasant-smelling oil. They may just do a little, little dab, you know, a little dab around, like clean up from the, from the farming sweat or whatever, that, that when they enter into a house, uh, they, they might actually want to, uh, the host might want to keep them in the house a little bit longer. Like it might be okay for you to like, like we're not going to do a quick dinner. We might actually sit down for this dinner because you guys don't smell so half bad, right? Or maybe the host themselves might provide what? An anointing. Some of you might recall uh, a couple stories of Jesus entering a home and people, what, washing his feet, anointing his feet, even before he went to the cross, an anointing being used upon his body and his hair. And I, this is a side note because we're close to Easter, but, but I can't help but wonder when that woman did that for Jesus. You guys know, we, we, we'll talk a little bit about anointing in, in a little bit later. We might have an opportunity to be anointed ourselves. But man, if any of you guys have ever been anointed before with like a, a, a more of a sweet smelling aroma, a pleasant oil, man, that sticks with you, right? That smell stays with you. And it's a constant reminder of either what was prayed for you or what you experienced or what God spoke to you. And I can't help but envision Jesus Upon that cross, after being anointed just maybe a couple days earlier, and his hair just infused with those oils and him gasping for breath, and as he inhales, he smells of the oil and he's reminded of the sacrifice that this woman made for him. And just move to continue to make this great sacrifice for all of mankind. Smells. It's good. It's pleasant. It sticks with you. You don't forget that moment. But the psalmist speaks of this not just being like a, a good smell, a, a deodorant of sorts. The psalmist speaks of it in regards to Aaron being anointed. And Aaron was brother of Moses, and Aaron represented a priestly line, the priestly line. Those that were anointed, the, the priests, the Levites were anointed, and that anointing signified, one, uh, an affirmation of, of God's voice and, and God's presence in their life, but also it signified these people are set apart. The, the, the Bible, the churchy word would be sanctified, holy, set apart. The unity that we experience when we come together, that they experienced in the city when they would come together, the unity experience when the people of God dwell together, guys, it's, it's an experience that is set apart. It's holy. It's different. It's, it's anointed. It's so different than, than being in a, in a coliseum with, with, with people who you, you kind of have the same opinion about which team you want to win. It's so different. The psalmist writes, and the people sing also of this unity being like a dew. Look at the third verse. It's like the dew of Hermon, they write, descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Dew. You ever think about dew? Not just mountain dew. You know, once in a while I might think about other dew. Dew, really, man, for, for our land, the way that God has created 
everything. Man, dew brings uh, refreshment. Dew nourishes. Dew brings life. And in this context, the dew that would, that would rest upon Mount Hermon may also not only be taken from the ground at Mount Her- Hermon, but may also flow into other streams that would make its way from Mount Hermon down to Mount Zion. So I want you just to take note of this, this little subtle illustration that the author gives us. Verse 2, verse 2, verse 3. Look at this. Verse 2, running down on the beard. Verse 2, running down on the garment. Verse 3, descending upon the mountains. Hey, and this should paint a picture for us that what we have, all that we have, the unity we share, the, the good and pleasure experience that we experience, where does that come from? It comes from above. It comes from God. All that we have. What is good and pleasant, what fills our hearts, what what moves us when we experience the unity of the family of God is so because of the power and love of God himself. This is why the psalmist can write. This is why the people can sing at least three times a year, if not more. This is why Jesus could sing as he journeyed with his disciples. This is why we can sing how good and pleasant it is when we dwell together Lastly, and and maybe briefly, look at 134, Psalm 134. It's titled, Praising the Lord in His House at Night. Let me read these three um, and give you a little context and and then close with some thoughts. Behold, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who by night stand in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord, the Lord who made heaven and earth Bless you from Zion. Some suggest that this may have been a song that was not so much sung on the journey into the city as much as the first thing they sing leaving the city. That potentially, potentially, families would be there for however long the festival and the feast would last. And then as they leave, they would sing this song to the priest, to the Levites, to the servants, is where we would get some of this reference, to the servants serving in the house of the Lord in the sanctuary. Because there were priests and there were Levites, as first introduced by by David, to be giving offering, to be worshiping in the day and at night. Day and night. Day and night. So potentially, contextually, the people would leave and they know they couldn't stay here forever, but they were comforted knowing that as they journeyed back and re-engaged life wherever God had planted them, that they knew there were people that there were priests representing them worshiping God day and night. So they would leave encouraging the servants of the Lord, don't stop praising him. Don't stop. Don't just, don't just check, you know, punch the clock, check the box, man. Continue to praise the Lord on our behalf day and night. And what a comfort that brought for those people to know that is taking place even while they aren't in the sanctuary, even though while, while they aren't at church, so to speak. And then the second part, verse 3, would, would potentially be a blessing that the priests would sing back to the people as they journeyed away. It kind of mirrors a little bit of an ironic blessing, but the Lord who made heaven and earth bless you from Zion. So what do we need to know? This is what we need to know. I'm going to close with this. Some application uh, for, for this passage as well. We need to know that the praises of God, what we give to him, and the blessings of God, what we receive from him, are not bound by or exclusive to a physical address. I want you to hear this. The praises of God, the the times we praise God, and the times we receive from God, uh, are not bound to or exclusive to 873 Canby Road, Redding, California, 96003. Which means, you see, this is the day where the tabernacle and, and the, the sanctuary resided in Jerusalem. But what, where we live now, post-resurrection, is we are the sanctuary. We are the tabernacle. My son, third grader, private school, he had to build a tabernacle. We turned it in this week. Man, what a blessing it was for my, my eight-year-old teaching me how we are the tabernacle. 
how dad, this is, this is the Holy of Holies. This is, this is where God would, would reside. This is where his presence would be. But man, we're now the Holy of Holies. The Spirit of God lives within us. So for the people of God to be comforted, knowing, okay, at least there's people in the sanctuary uh, praising God on our behalf, we need to know that we are to be praising God right now. That our praises don't, we don't just leave them here in this room and go about our, our day. That it's not like, well, hopefully Nathan's praising God for me on this one. No, no, no. We are praising God. The praises of God are not bound by or exclusive to a physical address. And we need to praise him, Haven, we need to praise him day and night. We need to praise him in the day when it's easy. Nothing looks too scary. I can see for a great distance. We need to praise him also in the night. Where my, 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 my range, my depth, my, I, can, I can only see so far before there's nothing else to see. When things, when things seem a little more trying, when, when my foot slips a little more, man, we still need to praise him day and night. And then we also need to know this. Not only is the praises of God's not bound by address, the praises of God, sorry, not bound by address, but also the blessings of God. What we receive from God, though he does great things and bestows great blessing and experiences in settings like this and on this property, it's not bound by this property. It's not only exclusive to settings like this. That where we go as the living sanctuary tabernacle now Man, where we go, God will provide blessing upon blessing upon blessing. He will speak to us. He will will answer our prayers. He will protect us. He will guide us. He will guard us. Man, the Spirit of God goes where we go. No one has to come here to receive Christ. No one has to come here to be prayed for. No one has to come here to be healed. Those things can happen and more. But guess what? You're the sanctuary. Your coworker can find Christ talking with you. Your, your coworker, your family member, your friend, they can be prayed with by you. You're just as much as a, a priest, an Old Testament priest, as I am. Guess what? Healing can come through your prayers, through your fasting. It just doesn't have to be mine or here. This is so beautiful. So my prayer is this. That we too would live, we, we, we would accept, we would celebrate the good and pleasant times that, that come by, by coming together as the family of God, the extended family of God, but, but also that we too would live lives that, that praise God day and night. That we too would, would live as men and women, um, as, as priests of the Old Testament, but, but in this day, wherever we go from here. And though our songs inside the building are going to declare our praises of God. I pray that our lives outside the building display our praises of God. May we never stop praising the Lord. Let me pray. God, thank you for these psalms. Thank you for uh, just even the, the picture of you, Jesus, considering these psalms as you journey back into the city for your final time. As you meditated on the psalms before uh, approaching that donkey and, and considering how much more and how greater, how, how uh, magnified these truths might become at the end of the next week of your life. God, would you give us all a a, a deep passion and and deep conviction and and a greater awareness of the good and pleasant that comes when dwelling with other brothers and sisters in Christ. Would you move us, Holy Spirit, to be men and women who praise the Lord all day, all night? Would we be quick to sing praise in any circumstance and even prepare our hearts and minds this Palm Sunday as we enter into celebrating the resurrection next Sunday 
thankful, Lord, for this journey, the last 14 weeks through these 15 psalms as our hearts and minds are prepared for next week. And would you complete that this next week? In the name of Jesus.